I'm trying something new today. I wanted to share my screen with you as I review the MRI of a brain of someone impacted by MS. Kind of walking you through the process that I use when I evaluate it, just to kind of share what that's like and what we can do to learn from the MRI. Hey! So we'll start off by splitting the screen up in a way that I prefer. And just to show you kind of what we're looking at here, this is two views or angles of the same brain obtained at the same time. Now, the one on the left, the one that's moving on this side, this is a top-down view of the brain. So here you can see the nose, the eyes, you can see the ears, and you're looking down on top of the brain, and this is called an axial view. Now, on the right-hand side over here, this is a side view. And so you're looking at the person from the side, and technically this is called a sagittal view. And if we center it here, you can see the nose and the lips right there and the jaw. This is the top of the head. Ponytail hangs down here and they're looking to the left. Now, both of these images are flare weighted images, which is fancy talk for water is bright in the brain. And so basically MS white spots show up here. And I'm going to kind of walk through it with you. Now, I'm going to leave the right hand side, the sagittal view, as is to help us as kind of a way of seeing at what level of the brain we're at. Right now, if we chopped the top of the head off here and we look down, this is what we're looking down on top of. So I'll be moving the screen on the left, and then you can see on the right at what level of the brain we're at. And just because I've always done it this way for a long time, I like to start looking at the bottom of the brain and then move up to the top. So let's start down here. So here we're cutting through the nose, and you can see the nose right there. And here we see some ears. My attention's back here at the brainstem, right where the brain has come up in, inside the skull. And that area of the brain, as we look here, is called the medulla. And then back here, we're seeing the cerebellum come into view. And at this level, my attention is caught right here. That's because there seems like there's a bright spot there that I don't see over there. And so I'm going to switch over to the sagittal view. So here you see the blue line is cutting through that lesion. And if I flip over to this image, you can see that the blue line is cutting through that image. And so that makes me feel reassured that that's probably a real lesion. And then we would use fancy doctor talk to describe where that is located. So then I'm going to keep coming up. And here you can see the eyes come into view and the nose. We still have ears on either side. If you guys would like me to go through where I actually describe all the parts of the brain, leave a comment in the section below let me know that. Now here we're seeing this white spot, and it's kind of near, maybe sitting on top of this black structure, and that's very relevant. So I'm going to leave that here and move over on the right, and I'm going to kind of zoom in on that so that we can see it. And so here we see cutting through it, that's what we're looking at, and if I flip that, we can see that this lesion is that lesion. And, and interestingly, there's another one up there. And if we focus on this bottom lesion, looking over here, I want to point out something. This white lesion is touching this black structure. The black structure is part of the ventricular system, so it's a ventricle, and it's full of spinal fluid. And when a lesion is touching the ventricle, that's called periventricular. And so periventricular is one of the classic locations to see multiple sclerosis. And so we have two lesions here. One is clearly periventricular. I'm coming up here. Now here, this structure is called uh, the corpus callosum. And here's another ventricle. And then we see this white spot here. And but this white spot is actually this lesion. So my point here is there's a lot going on, and by triangulating back and forth, it lets us kind of characterize it. There's another lesion. Here is another periventricular lesion. I'll move the cursor across it so I line up the side view with it. And what you can see is that this lesion, sorry, let me set that up, is this lesion. And here, it's touching the ventricle, so it's also periventricular. And I want to point out that it involves this C-shaped structure. 
This is the corpus callosum, and you can see one, two, three lesions in the corpus callosum, all periventricular. Again, these are things that are pretty classic uh, when looking for multiple sclerosis or at multiple sclerosis on the MRI. Here's a little lesion hanging out there, and we can run over and kind of look at it as well. And I bet you it's this right there. And what you can see is this lesion is actually periventricular. Here you're looking down on top of it. And there's a lesion there. Now, this lesion is not periventricular. It's actually called juxtacortical. The cortex is this gray structure. See, it's kind of dipping down there. And the cortex is the bark of the brain. Cortex is Greek for bark. And that's actually where all the thinking is done. All of this stuff down here, these are the wires. Now, the cortex is actually gray, although in these MRIs, they look light gray. And the white matter in the MRI here is darker, but it's actually white in real life. And so here you see the cortex and then the white matter. And the fancy pants term for that is juxtacortical. And juxtacortical is another classic location to see multiple sclerosis. So here's another lesion, which this is on the other side of the head. And this is another juxtacortical lesion. You can see here, maybe even more clearly than the last one, that it's kind of touching the junction of the cortex and the white matter beneath it. All right, so this kind of helps us understand what we're seeing on T2-weighted imaging, or particularly flare-weighted imaging. And we're not done yet, so there's a bunch of other things that I want to show you. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change some of the pictures around. Whoops. And let's take a look at this. Now, on the left, this is still a top-down view, but it's a different kind of picture. What we've done here is we've injected the dye, the gadolinium, the contrast dye. And what it does is it lights up the blood vessels. So here you see these white squiggly lines. These are blood vessels and they have dye in them so you can see them. And what we don't want to see is that the dye leaks out into the brain tissue. And so if you see that the dye leaks out into the brain tissue, that means that there's a breakdown of the barrier between the blood and the brain. And that would reflect a new lesion. And when I say a new lesion, I mean like new in the last couple weeks, like no more than maybe four weeks at the farthest reach, because then the blood-brain barrier seals up. And so if you see a contrast-enhancing lesion, that tells you something about time. And here, fortunately, we don't see any contrast-enhancing lesions. But what we do see is a black hole. And so this hole-looking structure is exactly what it sounds like. It's a hole. And it's an area where the inflammation was intense enough that it ate away at the tissue. Now, you see how dark the ventricle is full of spinal fluid, and this is less dark. And that's because there's still some axons that are there. They're not all completely destroyed. So the, the, the darkness of the black hole reflects the intensity of axonal loss. Now we can, again, flip some pictures around to better characterize this which I'll do right now. And I'm gonna show you this same lesion. Again, on the left over here, we're looking after the administration of contrast and it's called a T1 weighted image. And over here on the right, this is that image we looked at earlier, the T2. And what I'm showing you here, this is the same cut, is that it's bright on the flare, and this reflects a puddle of water. And over here, the black hole tells us that there's actually tissue missing. And the fact that it doesn't enhance tells us that it's not brand new. Now, it doesn't tell us how old, but it does suggest that it's not brand new and that the inflammation was intense enough that it left damage. Now, the more black holes you have relative to the bright spots, the worse it is prognostically. 
And as a rule of thumb, I think about having about one to two black holes for every 10 bright spots. And that's just a heuristic in my head. And there's another thing that we can learn from the scan on, on the left, now in the center. This is that post-contrasted T1 scan. We can look at it as it relates to brain volume. Now, here we see this black space. This is the third ventricle. And this patient is in their 20s. And to have a ventricle that wide in your 20s is very abnormal. So that raises a concern for central atrophy, which is something you can see in the setting of MS. Now, that's just a visual look. And there's a couple ways that you could try to characterize that. One way is old school, where you grab uh, a ruler, and then you try to measure it out. And you try to be really accurate, and you kind of compare it across time. I like to use a more modern way. What we've pulled up is a brain volume assessment, which is really cool. And what it does is, is it measures the size of that person's brain compared to people, their gender and their age. And it plots it on these graphs down here. And so I just want to walk through a few of them with you. And so this first one is looking at the entire brain volume, the whole brain. And it's asking the question, compared to people this gender and this age, how big is that person's brain? Now, it's not looking at function, it's just looking at size. And this black line here is the 50th percentile. What that means is if you lined up uh, 100 people that age and that gender, the average brain size would be right on this black line. And that dot represents this person. And what you see is their brain volume is 56th percentile, so it's above average. And then we start to look at the breakdown. And actually, there's a lot of data, but I'm just going to show you these three. The next one I look at is this, the thalamus. Now, the thalamus is this green structure in the center here. You can see it there and there. The thalamus is the sensory relay. It's a really important structure in the center of the brain. And it turns out that a small thalamus is one of the better correlates to long-term disability. So small thalamus, worse prognostic outcome. And so I look at the thalamus, and again, the black line here is the average size of the thalamus for a person this age and gender, and this patient's thalamus is really in line. It's 42nd percentile, and so that's, that's pretty darn good. And what's interesting is if you look in the center here, here we see, uh, looking at the, the ventricles, the spaces in the brain, those center spaces. Because if the brain's shrinking, then those spaces might get bigger. And interestingly, this patient, although they have a normal whole brain and a normal thalamus, have really large ventricles. And so that kind of is similar to my comment earlier that they look kind of big to me. One of the really important things that we should always do with the brain MRI is compare it to an old one. And that's maybe one of the most important um, things that are done with, with these scans. And so let me set that up for you and explain why. I'm going to split my screen, but this time I'm going to have two different studies. So I'll have one study on the left, and then I'll pull up a different study from a different time on the right. And so over here I'm going to pick my study that we've been looking at. And then in the right-hand side I'll pick an older study. So let's pick an old study, this one. And so I've now set it up so I can do a side-by-side -side comparison of the brain from October of 2020 compared to the brain from January of 2019. And what I can do is I can kind of compare lesions to see if they've gotten uh, bigger or if there's new ones or if they enhance. And that tells us a lot about the, the, how the person's doing. And if you're on a medication, and you're having new spots or enlarged spots or spots uh, that enhance, that tells me that that medication is not doing the best job that it could. And it makes us ask the question if we need to be doing something different. All right, sorry, I'm gabbing here. Let me set this up for us. Now, the first thing that you might notice is that it's not exactly the same picture. And there's lots of technical reasons for that. And as, you, uh, as MRI technology advances, the, the imaging changes and the sequences aren't the same. And you 
put the person in the scanner and if their head is tilted a little bit, you get different images. And so here, the bottom image includes their nose. Over here, the bottom image includes their teeth. But that's okay, because I'm looking back here and I'm used to looking at scans. And so now what we're doing is, as we move up on the brain, on the, scan, the new scan on the left, I'm gonna come over to the right and see if in the past that same spot was there. And if it was there, that tells me that it's not new in the time frame that I've looked. Here it is, and if you go back in time, there it was. In fact, I would tell you that it looks like it's gotten smaller, which is possible and that does occur. So I'm not worried about that spot. On the contrary, I'm kind of feeling good about it. It looks like it's maybe getting a bit smaller. It's definitely not bigger. Now as we move up, we're going to see that spot that we talked about earlier. And then we'll come over to the, the older scan and ask the question, was it there in the older scan? And the answer is yes. Does it look bigger? No, not really. It looks about the same. Now I should point out that this scan is slightly bigger than this scan. Again, that has to do with the zoom. It's not like this person's head shrunk. And so we're going to keep coming up. Here are some eyeballs. Whoops, that's not up, Aaron. That's down. Good job, Boster. And so let's just take a look at that lesion. Remember, we looked at this lesion earlier, and we saw that it did not enhance, but it did have a T1 black hole. So we didn't know how old it was. We can try to figure out if it was there at least the year before by seeing if we could find it. And there it is. So we now know that this spot is at least as old as the prior scan. And so that's more information. I would be really interested to know what you think of this format. Is this something that you enjoyed? Would you like to see more MRI scans or how we kind of talk about MRI scans? I love to talk about cervical spines if you're interested. So let me know in the comments section if this is a format that you'd like to see more of. My name's Aaron Boster and as always, I wanna thank you for learning about MS with me. Until my next video or my next live stream or the next time I see you at the Boster Center for MS, be safe and take care.